This episode was sponsored by Girls Can Crate, a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Real women make the best heroes, and every month, they deliver them to your front door. And by Jennifer Lee Olmsted, Jill Harrigan, Heather McKinnon, Ellen Gross, Valerie Jacobson, Chantelle Oliver, Jamie Lang, Maria Sanchez, Mandy Booty, Monique Harris-Pixado, Caitlin McTaggart, S.K. Kesson, and Sherry Cartwright. Thank you so much for being our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Katie. I have a question for you. Might take some thinking. Okay. I'll give you a second to ponder it. And our listeners, too. Mm. A little bit of self-reflection to start us off. In what ways are you a paradox? Ooh. That's a good question. Go ahead and think for a bit. Hmm. Well, so I took my first women's studies class in college to anger an (laughs) ex-fiancé. Which is the worst possible motivation (laughs) to take a women's studies class, but here I am. I guess so. It turned out to be a great, great life decision. (laughs) Spite has enabled a lot of my really good life decisions, actually. (laughs) Uh, I'm a a coward, oh. an absolute total coward in many ways, but then I'm constantly told that I'm incredibly brave about things that I don't <laughs> feel like I'm... Yeah. Right, like, really, you have to ask somebody else how you are because you can't see it. <laughs> oh, okay. In what way am I a paradox? No, but it has to be somebody who won't hurt your feelings. Let's see. Um. (laughs) In what nice way am I a paradox? (laughs) There's like obvious things, right? Like world traveler goes everywhere, does everything, lived everywhere, lives seven miles from where you grew up. You know. um. I think like the part... The more we dig into this, you know, I'm going to have this question in the front of my mind for the rest of the day. And I'm just going to be sitting here thinking, in what ways am I a paradox? Mm, Yeah. I think we're all a paradox. Yeah. And therefore, in history, everybody must also have been paradoxical. Oh, yeah. Um, But usually when we tell history, the paradoxes usually kind of get smoothed over. You know, they become Mm. a one-dimensional character Mm. with a simplified narrative that's easier to understand. So today I want to bring one of these paradoxical characters back. Mm. Here's a list of uh, phrases that define her. Okay, ready? Okay. Trailblazing Victorian medical doctor. Ooh. Welsh immigrant to America. On a wagon train heading west. Classic pioneer. All right. Polygamous wife. Ooh. National suffrage leader. Hmm. America's first female state senator. (gasps) Who ran against her husband and won. (laughs) Yay! Martha Hughes Cannon! (laughs) Yes. Oh, I love her. You just don't think there's going to be one person yes <laughs> carrying all of those titles in very unexpected turns <laughs> yes you just you can't make this stuff up yeah martha hughes cannon what a life of all the songs that have been sung within the states and nation there's none that comes so near the heart as uncle sam's relation yankee doodle is his name u.s is honored station i'm katie Red, nelson white, and i'm olivia mickle and this is what's her name nation. fascinating women you've never heard of Uncle Sam set up his house, he welcomed every brother But in the haste of his new life he quite forgot his mother Now his house is up in arms, a keeper he must find him To sweep and dust and set to rights, the tangles all about him I had not heard of Martha Hughes Cannon until like two years ago Mm. And well that's largely because we needed scholars to dig up her story And that scholar is... I'm Rebecca Clark historian for Better Days 2020 and co-author of the book Thinking Women, A Timeline of Suffrage in Utah. 
Hmm. And she first discovered Martha Hughes Cannon at Harvard in a class called Women, Feminism, and History. Ooh. Taught by none other than Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Ah. Who is, of course, the renowned author of so many things, but mostly famous for her quote, well-behaved women seldom make history. Yes. <laughs> so I was sitting there as a freshman and still trying to kind of find my bearings this first semester, you know, and um, she put up on the projector an image of the Women's Exponent, which was one of the longest running suffrage newspapers in the nation. And I just was blown away. And it hit me really personally because I had never heard this history before. And I remember at the time feeling like I knew that I needed to be a part of helping this story be told. Yankee Doodle will be glad to join with us in spreading the news abroad or all the land of Uncle Sam's great wedding. So I wrote my thesis on Utah women and specifically Latter-day Saint women in the women's suffrage movement. Martha comes up a lot because she was a really active suffragist. So I just fell in love with her and have been fascinated with her for a really long time. This history has been since 20 years ago when I first discovered it in college. I'm, it's, it's been personal for me because it helps me kind of find my place. And um, I, I love that. I'm grateful to these women who have come before us because they show that you can be deeply faithful and that that's not mutually exclusive with being outspoken and involved in, you know, whatever you want to be in your community. Men tell us it is fit that wives should submit to their husbands submissively, weakly. Though whatever they say, their wives should obey unquestioning, stupidly, meekly. Our husbands would make us their own victim take without ever a wherefore or why for it. But I don't and I can't and I won't and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. So she was born in Clandubno, Wales in 1857. And shortly after her birth, her family converted to Mormonism and they emigrated to Salt Lake City. She came by wagon train. Now, this is classic pioneer, like claiming the West kind of stuff. So she was just three years old when they arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. And it was a difficult time. You know, the United States was on the cusp of civil war. It was a difficult journey. Her baby sister died along the way and her father died just three days after they arrived in Utah. And so it was a, a rocky start. Then bid us be still and silent. And as she grows up, whether she's just born that way or the the rugged pioneer spirit comes through, she is fierce. Maddie was just shy of five feet, but she had this really right. She was so small physically, but she had this intrepid, big spirit and personality. She was dynamic and strong willed. And ambitious and she was a nonconformist and um, she was just intensely faithful and resilient intelligent and articulate and she loved science and wanted to be a doctor this girl has potential mm. and like all smart girls of the day she became a school teacher and i can't not see anne of green gables uh -huh. that's my point of reference Watching that growing up, it was like the dream job. Yeah. I would be as cool as her and be a school teacher. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it was not Martha's dream job. She hated it. <laughs> so Martha taught public school at the age of 14. And she ended up quitting uh, not long after because she had so much trouble controlling the male students in her class. So she <laughs> then followed some advice that Brigham Young gave to her to learn typesetting. And she worked as a typesetter for first the Deseret News and then worked at the Women's Exponent. So the Women's Exponent was the Relief Society newspaper, but it was also that suffrage newspaper that I mentioned earlier, one of the longest running suffrage newspapers. Oh, one, one of my still favorite magazines still yes. existing. And it's all digitized online. I've, they've published me. Really? 
Yeah. Hey! I've written a few things for them. What? How cool. We got to link that in the show notes. Yeah. And so she just became immersed in the women's rights movement very early on in her teenage years. And she was mentored by the editor, Emmeline B. Wells, who was the preeminent suffragist here in Utah and was so connected on a national and international level with suffrage leaders. So maybe it was her work in that field that convinced her to go on and follow her ambition, and she heads off to medical school. Hmm. So she went and did all her pre-med uh, requirements and her chemistry degree from the University of Deseret, which is now the University of Utah. And there's stories of how she would wear men's boots because she had to walk along through fields in, you know, through the mud, and she could walk easier in men's boots rather than wearing, you know, the little fashionable heels that women were wearing. And she cut her hair short so that it would be easier to do because she was so busy. Whoa. And so you see early on this nonconformist attitude. She knows what she wants, and she's going to do what it takes to get there and not worry about what others are thinking of her along the way. Ah, good for her. Yeah, especially <laughs> for the 1870s to cut your hair short. Yeah. She's just doing it. And there's a photo of her at this stage. You get to see her radical haircut. I wow. Like that is like 1870s punk right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she's doing. Yeah, that takes serious social guts. Yeah. I have a neighbor, one of those not very hard to find who'd know it all without debate and never change their mind I asked him what of women's rights he said in tones of ear my mind on that is all made up keep woman in her sphere I saw and then she goes on to medical school at the university of michigan one of the few places that will accept women into medical school at that time and graduates with her medical degree in 1880 and practices medicine in michigan for a little while and then decides she wants to get more education that there's more she needs to do so she moves to Pennsylvania and gets a pharmaceuticals degree from the University of Pennsylvania. She's the only woman in her class of 75, but that doesn't deter her at all. And then at the same time, she takes night classes from the National School of Elocution and Oratory. Oh my gosh. So, right? And I love, I love that, that even at that age, she's 25 and she already knows that she wants to be a doctor and she's getting all the education she needs to for that but that there's another piece of it that she needs she knows she wants to be an advocate and so she gets that oratory degree so that she is well equipped her rights are just the same as mine let woman choose her sphere where are these elocution that's ironic. I just stumbled over that word. <laughs> Where are these classes today? It's something that seems like it's died out of American culture. We yeah. we want to sound natural, not well. Although there are still there's a booming trade in courses to help you l lose or acquire an accent. Oh, even that, in America? Yeah, absolutely. What? And especially if you want to go into politics or news. Okay. And one of my favorite facts about this booming industry is that there is equal demand for the programs to lose a Boston accent and to acquire a Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> and it is the only one that is equally popular on both sides. I love that. <laughs> Isn't it great? Yes. Acquire, please. Yes. Acquire. <laughs> I would love to sit in on a Victorian elocution class. Mm. I am sure it would be delightful. But she came out the other end, uh, a world leader, tied up in a nice little bow. Hmm. By the time she was age 25, she had earned four degrees. And this is at a time when women rarely even went to college. And she heads back to Utah. Mm. So then she comes back to Salt Lake and she opens a small private practice, but then very quickly is hired to become the resident physician at Deseret Hospital. Now Deseret Hospital was funded and run almost entirely by Utah women. They created this hospital and she came on as the resident physician. 
Yay! And I love that this team of women are like, we need a hospital. They make it happen and then they go, hmm, we need a doctor in charge of all this. Let's <laughs> pick this girl over here. Just this little waif of a thing. Hmm. And she is the boss at the hospital. And then, the moment. She locks eyes with a man across <gasps> the foyer. <gasps> He's on the board of trustees. They've come to tour this new hospital. Oh, hello, Miss Hughes, he says. And she says, um, that's Dr. Hughes, okay? <laughs> No, we don't actually know any specifics, <laughs> but we do know that she met at that hospital a member of the board. A handsome, prominent Latter-day Saint church leader named Angus Cannon. He was the Salt Lake State president, so he was a pretty big deal. And so she met him there and fell deeply in love. And they were secretly married in 1884. Now, oh. their marriage was unusual, even for Utah at that time. <laughs> He was 23 years older than her. And that was a pretty big age gap even then. Plus, he already had three wives and 17 children. Wait, what? <laughs> uh, it's a minor problem for Utah at this <laughs> <Yeah>. point. <laughs> All the good ones are taken. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. But it's Ew. love. It's true love. Nothing's going to stop them. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but here's where we get to dig into polygamy a little bit, because mm -hmm. so you can be cynical modern feminist, OK? All right. um, and I will be believing polygamist uh, Martha Hughes Cannon. All right. She defended polygamy for her whole life. So she says out loud. OK, so what would you say? She's just been like manipulated by her surroundings? It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> well and argued. she's lying. <laughs> <laughs> and anyone who says they liked it is lying. From the, okay, so from the modern perspective, how does it exploit women? Or like, why, why is it well, bad for women? Well, because women are not trading cards that you get to, <laughs> that you get to just keep a collection of and add new ones when one takes your fancy. <laughs> I mean, well, not the core level. Yes. <laughs> Never heard it better argued. <laughs> However. <sighs> it might seem counterintuitive that such an independent woman uh, would willingly enter this relationship with an older man who already had several wives. She was intensely spiritual and she believed in polygamy. But she also just wanted to marry him. And the letters between Angus and Maddie over the course of their marriage really indicate their sincere and their mutual affection. Um, but as time goes on, this marriage was plagued by separation and, and jealousy and heartache because they were never able to live together as husband and wife through the entire more than three decades of marriage. But there's, you know, on the personal side for Martha, as she's living through all this, there's this star-crossed quality to her marriage. And Despite all these challenges that she goes through, she later still defends her marital choice and defends the controversial system of polygamy. She said to a San Francisco newspaper in an interview, she said, I believe in polygamy. A plural wife is not half as much a slave as a single wife. If her husband has four wives, she has three weeks of freedom every single month. A plural wife has more time to herself and more independence in every way than a single one. So this is her argument. Yeah, yeah, I've read their journals. <laughs> Progressive and freeing or not, mm. however you interpret polygamy at this time, this is a bad time to be a polygamist. It was the worst possible time to enter into a polygamous marriage. This is the height of the national anti-polygamy movement. There were federal raids arresting men, um, living with multiple wives. If they had any evidence at all, if they even showed up at the same location, and there was even a rumor, many of the people ended up having to go into hiding. And that happened with Martha. Federal government is cracking down hard on polygamy in Utah. Like the rest of the country is looking at Utah and going, oh, the horror. Yeah. We must stomp out this evil. It's a battle for the moral character of the whole of America. Almost immediately after she gets married, she gets pregnant, and Angus gets 
arrested. Hmm. Now, pregnancy was considered proof. So there was a warrant out for her to testify as a key witness, not just against her husband, but she was also a physician. And she had delivered many of the babies of oh. men who were being prosecuted. And so she was a key witness to incriminate many of her obstetrics patients as well. She writes to a friend saying she can't face being instrumental in depriving children of their fathers. She evades the federal court system and she goes into hiding so that she doesn't have to testify. Now her husband still ends up going to prison based on his marriages to other wives, but they weren't able to use her. She goes all the way to England and there she is, a stranger in a strange land. And she's Whoa. writing letters back to Angus. Just her situation is so crazy because she's there with a baby. She has to explain why she's there and mm. who she is and where her husband is or isn't. And she's just tortured. Aww. And she's so mad about it, too, because the other wives get to hang around. But yeah. she, because she knows stuff and does stuff, she yeah. has to disappear. So she's totally heartbroken. Aww. And then adding insult to injury, Angus took a fifth wife an even younger wife, six years younger than Martha, just a few weeks before she left for England. Oh dear, what can the matter be, dear, dear? What can the matter be, oh dear? What can the matter be, women are wanting to vote? Women have husbands, they are protected. Women have sons by whom they're directed. Women have fathers, they're not neglected. Why are they wanting to vote? Women have homes, there they should labor. Women have children whom they should favor. Women have time to learn of each neighbor. Why are they wanting to vote? Let's pause for a second to thank our sponsor, Girls Can Crate. It really is the perfect time to start a subscription to Girls Can Crate. Every month, they'll deliver a brand new real-life Shiro to your front door, introducing kids to a fascinating woman who changed the world, complete with a gorgeous 28-page activity book, all the materials for two to three STEAM activities like experiments, art projects, and more. Girls Can Crate is a lifesaver for anyone trying to homeschool, hybrid school, or just entertain their kids, and it's a wonderful educational surprise for any kid from ages 5 to 10. For busy families, they have digital subscriptions and mini crates too. Check them out now at girlscancrate, C-R-A-T-E dot com and use the coupon code HERNAME, all one word, to get 20% off your first month's crate. Oh dear, what can the matter be, dear, dear, what can the matter be, oh dear, what can the matter be, women are wanting to vote. Women are traveling about here and there. Women are working like men everywhere. Women are crowding and claiming to spare. Why are they wanting to vote? Women have reared all the sons of the brave. Women have shared in the burdens they gave. Women have labored your country to save. That's why they're wanting to vote. So it's oh dear, what can the matter be, dear? What can the matter be, oh dear? What can the matter be when men want every vote? Now, speaking as a feminist in 2021, <laughs> this is the point at which I want her to just bail. I want her to stay in England or something. You know? I want her to just be like, forget it, dude, I'm out. And set up a practice mm. in England or something. But um, she's a real human. <laughs> and she loves him, for one. Mm. So as soon as the period of danger is over, she heads straight back to Utah, gets pregnant again, and mm. has to go on the run again to San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I think appeals about Utah, not just that mm, it's, yeah. you know, her home and her people, but yeah. if if one believed in women's rights and equality in the 1880s, Mm. then Utah might be the place to be. Oh, yeah. They received the vote early on, but then had a very complicated history of the national government taking it away. As part of the Edmunds-Tucker Act in 1887, um, the federal government 
took away women's right to vote in Utah Territory. Mm, yeah. It was a way to try to crush polygamy. They were just putting all the pressure they could on Utah and Mormonism. Mm -hmm. So women could vote in Utah in 1870. But in 1887, the federal government swoops into Utah Territory and says, nope, women do not have the right to vote. Utah suffragists rallying together, mobilizing, and winning back the right to vote when Utah became a state. So now the pressure is, I mean, the only way women are going to get the right to vote back is by Utah Territory becoming a state. Mm, yeah. But the only way to do that is to give up the practice of polygamy because that's against federal mm. law. Yeah. There's just a lot of push and shove. But the federal government is trying all kinds of things, too. They're putting on pressure everywhere. They're seizing property. They're, they're about to crush the Mormon church into the ground. Mm. And then finally, in 1890, comes a manifesto. It's issued by the president of the church himself, Wilford Woodruff, and he says, no more polygamy. We're done. Mm -hmm. And so she's in San Francisco when she just reads this manifesto, polygamy over. And she's there with two kids. Uh, and yet again, I'm, I'm thinking, like, just stay in San Francisco. It's probably going to be easier for you, Martha. Sure. But no. As <laughs> soon as the period of danger is over, she is back in Utah again. And she has got an axe to grind. Hooray! She's like, let's get this done. Let's get our rights back. <laughs> let's fix this, America. It is just a hundred years ago our mothers and our sires lit up for all the world to see the flame of freedom's fires. Through bloodshed and through hardship they labored in the fight. Today we women labor still for liberty and right. Oh, we wear a yellow ribbon upon our women's breast. We are prouder of its sunny hue than of a royal crest. T'was God's own primal color born of purity and light. We wear it now for liberty, for justice and for right. And always she's presenting her case on the basis of equality. And they gather together in this huge meeting at Assembly Hall and Martha stands up and she says, no privileged class, either of sex, wealth or descent, should be allowed to arise or exist. All persons should have the same legal right to be the equal of every other if they can. Now that's progressive for that time. I mean, that's, that's reminiscent of what we're still talking about in our society yes. today. Martha would have been in her element in 2020 for many reasons, on a public health level and on these issues of equality and rights. I love how relevant she is to us today still. We wear it now for liberty, for justice and for right. 1895, thanks to Utah's successful pretense that no one is practicing polygamy anymore, <laughs> Utah became a state. And the first order of business was women's re-enfranchisement. Uh, Maddie was the first woman in Salt Lake City to register to vote, chomping at the bit. The next year, 1896, women can run for office. Yay! Maddie is nominated for one of the five state Senate positions. She ends up accepting the nomination for the Democratic ticket. And then she says she went home and she congratulated Mr. Cannon on his nomination. So her husband, at the same time, was nominated on the Republican ticket at their convention. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> wow. And, and the, How did that dinner go? I Exactly. Oh, to be a fly on the wall. Shouldn't have taken that fifth wife, Angus. Glory, glory, hallelujah. The truth is marching on. There's some great newspaper coverage of this. The press is just eating it up. Oh, as yeah, you of course. Would. But going up against her husband made national news. The newspapers loved the drama of this, right? <laughs> so one of my favorite moments is um, the Republican-leaning newspaper endorsed her husband. Then the Democratic-leaning newspaper, the Salt Lake Herald, endorsed Maddie and stated, quote, she is the better man of the two. Send Mrs. Cannon to the state Senate as a Democrat and let Mr. Cannon as a Republican. 
remain at home to manage home industry. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> the truth is marching on. The trumpet then was sounded that shall never call retreat. Up down the century softly we hear the tramp of feet. Today we still are marching to that same old music sweet. Of truth still marching on. We're here to For all of the drama and how fraught it was in many ways, there's a closeness that remains and a respect for each other that comes through in, in their letters. It says a lot about him, I think, at that time, because even with how widespread the support for women's suffrage was in Utah at that time, she was taking it a step further, by far. Several steps further. This is a big election, 1896, nationwide. This is the emergence of, of bitter partisan politics, which we know... Mm -hmm. A lot about real nastiness. But in the end, in Utah, there was a Democratic sweep. Mm -hmm. And she became the first female state senator in American history. <laughs> Take that, Angus. In a newspaper interview after her election, she says, I'm the only woman in the Senate. But then we are every one of us Democrats there. So I shall feel perfectly at home. She is going to just own it. And say, I am perfectly at home here because I'm one of them. She had goals and she had plans and she knew what policies needed to change. And she knew that she was well equipped to change those. She gets the predictable questions from the press. How are you going to take care of your children? Exactly. Who will make dinner for your husband? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, it, this was 140 years ago, but mm -hmm. female politicians and CEOs, they're still getting asked these exact same questions today. Yep. And her answer is as gold now as it was back then. Hmm. She says, you give me a woman who thinks about something besides cook stoves and wash tubs and baby flannels, and I'll show you nine times out of ten a successful homemaker and a successful mother. And she throws that right back out there and says, and says how good it is for her kids to have that independence and that they do better because of her working and that she's a better mother because she has this broader sphere and broader influence um, and more purpose. Senator Cannon, she is going to get it done. <laughs> she went straight to work with laser-like focus. And she introduced three bills within the first month. So she's a doctor. She's well-versed on this new germ theory. Still not widely accepted. She sponsors a pure food law. Um, she sponsors a law regulating working conditions for women and girls. Um, she fights for widespread vaccinations. <laughs> <laughs> I told you she's very relevant for yeah. today. Um, and she helped end a statewide smallpox outbreak when that widespread vaccination plan didn't go through. <laughs> um, she helps end the smallpox outbreak by removing communal cups from the drinking fountains in downtown Salt Lake. She also secured funding for the education of speech and hearing impaired students and for their health care. And she established Utah's first state board of health and served on that board. So she got a lot done during her time. Yeah. Even though she's this woman coming in to a man's world, she's able to get these things passed. At the national level, she's a speaker and an activist to get other states in America, all American women, and I mean all, equality with a capital E. She doesn't care where you come from or what color your skin is or anything. Equality mm. is equality. Fearless. I just... The more I learn about Martha, she just becomes more and more heroic. There is a band of women, and to our manner born, emerging from the darkness past and looking toward the morn. Their mothers labored, waited through a night without a star. The morning shows a suffrage flag that bears a woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. She's accomplishing so much as a legislator. She's made national news. It's all positive. She's testifying before Congress. 
she's this is her time. And then, as with all good political stories, scandal strikes. She's getting larger. <gasps> she's getting um, more rotund. Hmm. She's pregnant. Hmm. And eventually she gives birth. <laughs> and collectively, America goes, wait, what? <laughs> Martha becomes pregnant and has her third child, Gwendolyn, while she's still in office. And so the whole nation is in an uproar saying, oh my gosh, Utah is still practicing polygamy. It's over for her. She can't run again. And so she, she finishes her term. And she fades from the national scene. In freedom's name, guarding homes, altar fires, daughters of patriot sires, their zeal our own inspires, justice to claim. And she really devotes herself to her medical practice for the rest of her life. She's vice president of the National Congress of Tuberculosis. She works in the orthopedic department of the Gray's Clinic in Los Angeles. Ugh. And I mean, she still did great things, mm. but what could she have done? Mm. What could she have pulled off had her reproductive and marital status not been <laughs> society's single measure of a good woman? Uh, would, did she talk publicly about what that felt like? I mean, was she, I would have been furious. We don't know how she felt mm. because at some point in that final phase of her life, she destroyed everything. Uh. She destroyed all of her personal papers. Uh. I, I think there was a lot of heartbreak in her life as well as a lot of success and accomplishment. Um, you know, and, and in that way, she's like a lot of us. Now I'm singing Hamilton again. <laughs> Removing myself from the narrative. Mm, exactly. That's what she did. She really made a difference here and yet was forgotten for a long time. But mm. boy, oh boy, are we putting her back in these days. Yay. Martha Hughes Cannon is everywhere. Yeah, so Better Days 2020 is a public education nonprofit that's dedicated to popularizing Utah women's history. One of the accomplishments that we're most proud of is that there will be a new statue of Martha Hughes Cannon that has now been made by sculptor Ben Hammond. And that new statue of Martha Hughes Cannon will soon be inducted into National Statuary Hall at the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. So every state gets two statues to represent their state. And Martha will be replacing the inventor of the television, Philo Farnsworth. Wow. And she'll actually become just the 10th woman out of the 100 statues. And, and so she's an important symbol, not just for Utah, but for the nation. But that uh, induction ceremony has been delayed, of course, because of COVID <laughs> restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, so the new statue is temporarily on display inside the state capitol in Salt Lake City. And once we can gather again safely, we don't just want to put her in quietly. We want to make a big deal and hold the big ceremony that we originally planned. So when we send Martha to Washington, there will be a ceremony and we will, we will celebrate. Martha was a trailblazer in so many ways and a pioneer in, in so many ways. And she, I think, continues to be that for us today. She was a medical doctor, a polygamous wife, a national suffrage advocate, and the first female state senator in the nation. She actually ran against and beat her own husband for that Senate seat. <laughs> and she's amazing. In 
in a letter she wrote to an old friend, she kind of encapsulated her whole life philosophy in one sentence. Let us not waste our talents in the cauldron of modern nothingness, but strive to become women of intellect and endeavor to do some little good while we live in this protracted gleam called life. Very special thanks to Rebecca Clark for bringing us the story of Martha Hughes Cannon. You can find her book, Thinking Women, A Timeline of Suffrage in Utah, on our website, whatshernamepodcast.com, where you can also find the link to the nonprofit Better Days 2020, which has all kinds of resources for teachers, for parents, and for kids exploring all things women's history in Utah. All the songs you heard in this episode were authentic, suffrage anthems recorded by Elizabeth Knight. You can find these songs at the Smithsonian Folkways Collection and the Library of Congress. And the final song, March of the Women, was recorded by the Glasgow University Chapel Choir directed by Katie Cooper. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook where we post all kinds of extra content every week. And if you're hoping that travel is possible in 2021, then check out our website and click on tours because What's Her Name podcast is leading our first travel adventure to England in September 2021. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for donating. 